Hello again, and welcome to chapter 18, Air Pressure and Wind. So this is gonna talk about what drives the wind and the forces, including air pressure, solar, pressure gradients. I mean, we all feel wind you know, most days, not all days. And what can the different uh, variations in pressure tell us about the weather that either is about to happen or already has happened. So let's go ahead and get right into that. Atmospheric pressure is the force of the weight of all of the air above us. And when you're just sitting there at sea level, it's about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now that seems like a lot, but you don't really feel it because the pressure is distributed in all directions. So it's not just coming straight down on you. It's also coming up, it's coming from the sides, it's coming all over the place. So you don't feel that weight on you like you would, let's say if you were in deep water where you start to feel the weight of the water because water weighs a lot more. So in English units, it's 14.7 uh, 14 pounds per square inch at sea level or one kilogram per square centimeter in metric at sea level. Now, atmospheric pressure decreases with increasing altitude. So some of that, meteorologists have to take that into account when they're dealing with, with air pressures because otherwise, um, you know, places like Denver are always going to have lower pressures than, let's say, here in Milwaukee, because they're at 5,000 feet above sea level, and we're only at about 630. So the units of measurements that was first um, uh, devised was that's used by meteorologists in the United States, at least, is what's called the millibar, and the millibar is at 1,013.2 millibars roughly at standard sea level pressure. That actually does fluctuate a little bit, but um, that's about average at sea level for how much pressure using the, the millibar uh, units. So you can imagine having sort of this column of air and at the surface of the earth, you have much more air at 14.7 pounds per square inch than you would if you go way, way up in altitude. You get less and less air molecules. So there's less pressure. Um, that, that's why astronauts have to wear pressurized suits because out in space, there's no air pressure and it would just allow their internal organs to basically boil over. So those pressure, their suits have to exert a pressure on their body to simulate that same pressure that's uh, accounted for here on Earth. Now, the units of measurement that we use is what's called inches of mercury. Now, this was devised way back in the 1600s, but it's still used today because that's kind of what people understand. S same thing applies to the Richter scale in earthquakes, for example. Us, me as a seismologist who studies earthquakes, I never use the Richter scale. It's an old scale that was devised for Southern California using a very specific instrument. But what happened was, is the media caught on to that. And now the general population understands the Richter scale. Well, the same sort of thing applies with inches of mercury. We don't actually use mercury to measure this anymore because mercury, mercury is highly toxic. But when this scale was first devised back in the 1600s, that's how he did it. So what we found is at sea level pressure, which is sort of the, you know, right in the middle there, is 29.92 inches of mercury. And I'll explain that on the next slide. So the mercury barometer was invented by a gentleman named uh, Torricelli in 1643. Now he was an actual student of Galileo's. So he used a glass tube that was filled with mercury and then he inverted that glass tube and put it in a well of mercury. And then when it equalized, that's how he knew that that was causing the air pressure. So nowadays, because again, mercury is really, really nasty stuff, we use an aneroid barometer uh, techniques, which means without liquid. And it uses sort of this expanding chamber um, to, you know, be able to measure very slight differences in uh, air pressure. And when you attach sort of a pen to that, so you can actually see it over uh, time, we call that a barograph. Just like in earthquakes, we call it a seismograph. 
Here's an image of a mercury barometer that Torricelli first devised. And as you can see, you have a glass-filled tube that has a vacuum. And what that means is there's no air in there. And he inverted that so it sticks down here into a big pool of mercury. So as the mercury sort of equalizes itself, it's feeling the pressure, the air pressure down on it here. So that as more air pressure comes down, the higher up in this tube that particular mercury will go. And that's what we call high pressure. And on the opposite side of that, when you have less pressure, the, it'll, more of it will go down into the pool down here and less it'll actually go down, which we call low pressure. And again, just to reiterate, the average at sea level height is this 29.92 inches in mercury. That's an average, but so this is the original mercury barometer. Again, not used too much anymore because of the toxicity of mercury, but that's how we first devised it. Now we have this thing called an aneroid barometer, which allows it to um, use a set, set of levers here to very, very, uh, pick up very small changes in air pressure. So as the air squeezes it, it records high pressure and as it sort of unsqueezes it or when there's low air pressure, it expands. Now, if you look in this particular, um, this, uh, particular graph here, this image, you can see that there's somewhat high pressure going on here. And typically we associate high pressure with clear skies and low pressure with sort of precipitation, rain, and things like that. And you'll see that as we go. So if this line, this black dial was over here somewhere, you could probably expect rain because it's a low pressure system overhead. So here's an image of an actual barograph. So they took this, this um, aneroid uh, pressure sensor and they attached a, a, a drum to it along with an arm so you can continuously see the variations in the air pressure over a given time. Again, this is the same sort of concept as with earthquakes with a seismograph. Now, I'm sure all this is done digitally now, but you know this is how it was done hundreds of years ago. So as the air pressure changes, it goes up or down, you get a record of that over, let's say, a 24-hour period. Now, the way wind works, is that it always moves from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And that's just how it works. So you can imagine high pressure, let's say, is coming down off a mountain, right? It's coming down off, off a mountain, it kind of goes swoosh down the mountain and creates a wind, uh, a, a higher wind, because it's going from a high place to a low place. Now that's altitude, it's not quite the same thing, but it's the same idea. Wind always goes from the high pressure to the low pressure. And when those two are very close together, when there's not a lot of space between where the high pressure is and the low pressure is, you get very, very windy days. So here is another image of, I'm gonna turn my camera off here for a second. Here's an image of what it would look like. And you could see when you have areas that have very long breaks between the different um, pressures, you have weak winds. And then when you have a whole bunch of lines here at once, you get strong, uh, a steeper pressure gradient. So you get stronger winds. Now, and that's how, if you look at the weather every night and they'll show you sometimes show these pressure gradients, especially when they know there's going to be windy days. And they'll show you that these lines of uh, pressure will get closer and closer together. And sometimes they can get really close together, like during hurricanes and things like that, where you can get 90, 100, 150 mile an hour winds. The pressure gradient is super th thin and there's a lot going on there. So here's a map that shows sort of what happens over a continent continent um, for any given day, we'll say. Now you see, you can see here, you have this red L for low pressure and you have a blue, a blue H for a high pressure system. Now what you wanna get out of this image is that around the low pressure image, you can see that the lines are much closer together than they are up here. And if you look at 
the these um, these symbols over here as you go down I'm gonna turn my camera off for a second as you go down you can see that the winds get higher and higher and higher so around the low pressure system here like right here for example those winds are anywhere from 55 to 60 miles an hour and the direction of the flag tells you which way it's going so these winds are going in that direction now on the opposite side of that you have over in the um, uh, the high pressure zone you have very very soft winds and in fact down here let's say Arizona these are calm winds so there's nothing going on down there which is very typical actually for a desert region so whenever we get storms here in Milwaukee very often it almost always in fact it's associated with a low pressure zone there are several things that controls how the wind uh, works here on earth one of them is called the Coriolis effect now earth is spinning so in the northern hemisphere it's spinning and so it automatically deflects things to the right now on your screen that looks like it's going to the left but it, it, from where I'm sitting it's going to the right um, so everything it gets deflected because of Earth's rotation and like I mentioned in the in the northern hemisphere it's to the right and then to the southern hemisphere it's to the left the other portion of the wind is friction now this is only playing a role near the surface but friction plays a role as to how fast or slow can help can dictate um, uh, how fast or slow those winds can actually get it acts to slow the wind down especially when you have lots of topography let's say the Appalachian Mountains or you know rolling hills and things like that that become impediments to the wind so in this image you can see how this Coriolis affects if we have a non rotating earth like up here in the top which we don't have but if we did everything would be in a straight line <laughs> that is not a straight line I apologize everything would be in a straight line it's from from the pole to the target you get the idea I'm trying to do this with a mouse I'm sorry however because earth is spinning everything in the northern hemisphere like I mentioned gets deflected to the right like this you can see that here too so that plays a role in wind direction which also plays a role in the type of ocean currents because the wind prevailing winds are directed by this Coriolis effect and you get very, um, ocean currents that go along with that we'll talk more about that later in the semester now in the upper air winds like not down here by the surface but further up they have basically blow parallel to isobars or what they call uh, geostrophic winds so there's no friction up there so they're they're very fast winds now this is where we get things like the jet stream you may have heard this on the news and the jet stream while way up in the air often dictates what kind of weather we get if the jet stream in the winter comes plunging down from the north we have a tendency to get super cold days because it's bringing that cold air down from Canada it's sort of a river of air at high altitude and it could be anywhere from 120 to 240 kilometers per hour many times jet airliners will actually get up into this and use it to save fuel on long journeys as long as they can stay in it um, it'll actually save fuel so this image is showing you us what happens at in the upper upper uh, level of winds because there's no friction taking place way up there as the wind gets stronger and that's what these purple arrows are the pressure gradient is in this direction which are the red arrows and as the wind gets stronger the Coriolis effect gets stronger as well excuse me to the point where then the wind and the the, uh, the isobars are in the same direction which means the pressure gradient and the Coriolis effect are in balance and that's where, where we get what are called geostrophic winds and again these can go from anywhere from 75 to 150 miles an hour in the upper atmosphere here's a, a, what the effects of friction are on the wind so if you look at the upper diagram way up in the upper level like we mentioned in the previous slide when you got strong winds there's very little there's no friction so the winds are able to go parallel to the isobars they parallel to the pressure gradient whereas when you start getting 
uh, friction from the ground, you could see in this particular diagram, the pressure gradient is in this direction, the same direction as the red arrow. And the Coriolis effect is trying to deflect it to the right, of course, because we're spinning. So there is less, it doesn't go completely parallel like in the upper image, but it is being deflected just not as much because of that friction of the ground surface. So cyclones and anticyclones, these are spinning air depending on the direction they're going with. Now a cyclone is associated with rising air, so air going up, and then it's the center of a low pressure, which often brings clouds and precipitation. You, that, that'll be a common theme throughout this entire chapter. The opposite of that is the anticyclone is associated with sinking air. It's a, a center of high pressure because the pressure is making it sink and pressure increases towards the center, pushing the air away from it. And you'll see that in the image in the next slide. So in this image, you can see that for a low, uh, low pressure zone, you can see that the, they're going counterclockwise around it, and it's kind of pulling the air into it, whereas an anticyclone is moving clockwise and pushing air away from it because it's sinking and going out. Whereas this one's rising and sucking it in, so to speak, the, the low pressure zone. And this is why you get often get windy days with uh, low pressures because that wind is rising and it's bringing, it's essentially sucking you in wind from the bottom, creating steeper pressure gradients. Now a cyclone or a, a low, is you know it's a center of a low pressure it pressure decreases towards the center and it's in the northern hemisphere they're inwards and counterclockwise like i just showed you and in the southern hemisphere they're inwards and uh clockwise and again that a lot of that has to do with the fact that of the earth spinning that's just the nature of how the winds rotate on a rotating planet now the anticyclone in the northern hemisphere is directed outwards or what we call divergence and in a clockwise fashion and the same thing goes now they're counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere and they're associated with subsiding air which is air being pushed down and it usually means nice weather so yeah if, if you're looking in the, a summer day you know if we got thunderstorms coming usually it's associated with a low pressure zone and we have nice warm sunny days with you know lots of sun and very few clouds those are typically associated with uh high pressure zones so here you can see again the difference between the two so a <clears throat> a, a high pressure is moving counterclockwise or excuse me clockwise and it's kind of spiraling downwards outwards so it's it's converging downwards and spinning and pushing the air out from it. Whereas a low is spinning counterclockwise and it's taking that air and sort of sucking it in and then rising it up and spitting it out the top. And that's where, because it's rising air, you're usually taking cool air going up to, uh, or excuse me, warm air up to cool air. It creates uh, clouds. Those clouds start to rotate. You get things like thunderstorms and tornadoes. And that it's just the nature of the, the direction they're spinning in and that they're sucking that air in and making it rise because there's low pressure. There's not as much to keep that air from rising because uh, it's, it's low pressure. <laughs> in general, there's three types of atmospheric, three pairs of atmospheric cells that redistribute the heat around the planet. And the reason why this occurs is because there's unequal surface heating. So some areas of the earth get more sun, like the equatorial regions, than let's say the polar regions. And those differences in the amount of heat um, translate into um, pressure gradients that occur. That's what we've been talking about creating wind patterns and then obviously those wind patterns form into things like sub, uh, surface lows and surface highs that redistribute the air in various ways. So some of these include the equatorial low pressure zone where you have lots and lots of rising air, abundant precipitation. So this is right at the equator in the jungle, so to speak. You also have the subtropical high pressure zone now, if you didn't know this, this is where we get a lot of the deserts. 
So around 30 degrees latitude, you get these subtropical highs around the Earth. Most of the Earth's deserts occur within this sort of 30 degrees latitude. The Sahara does, 30 degrees north. And Australia, which is mostly desert, is 30 degrees south. These include things like the trade winds and the westerly winds, which I'll show you um, in some uh, figures in a bit. You also have the subpolar low pressure areas where warm and cold winds interact. So you get lots of storms in this area. This is very frequent around, you know, sort of the outer rim of the uh, of the polar regions in, you know, Alaska, in the, you know, in the north, um, up into Russia and Siberia, and then also in the south around the rim of Antarctica. And then you get the polar high pressure zones where you have subsiding air, you get lots, of, you get uh, polar fronts, but it's it can get very nasty. But you have a tendency to have much more high pressure because the wind, just the way the wind patterns are at the poles. So here's an idealized global circulation. So you can see that the polar easterlies come off in this direction. And then you have the westerlies, which is what dictates a lot of our weather. And you'll see that here we are right here, we're right here. We're sort of right at the forefront of where we can get those polar fronts along with, um, you know, westerly winds. Now, if you take a look down here at the, the equator, you got the trade winds, which go from coming out of the northeast in the northern hemisphere or the southeast in the southern hemisphere. And they meet at the equatorial low, which creates lots and lots of precipitation. All right. So the, there, there's a lot going on here globally. Again, these are idealized cells. These are it, it it's the the averages of it all for sure. But obviously you get, you know, uh, little abnormalities here and there. But our weather is very much dictated by these westerly winds, combining that with these sort of polar easter winds, eastern winds, excuse me, that when they combine, we have a tendency to get storms around here. But also we get a lot of storms that come up from other parts of the world, you know, up from this, this area out on the plains. But those are usually associated with these uh, polar fronts. Now, polar doesn't always necessarily mean cold. It, a lot of it just has to do with wind direction as well. So let me just make that clear. It doesn't have to be cold per se. It's just the, the overall direction of the winds. Now, the continents play a huge role in the surface seasonal temperature differences um, in the global sort of pressure patterns, wind patterns, because continents add friction. So, and then you have altitude, things like mountain ranges, and valleys, and all of that is plays a role in our wind patterns. And it's especially obvious in the Northern hemisphere. The bulk majority of the land masses on earth are in the Northern hemisphere. So things like um, water flows on the land with more moist uh, air from the ocean, this creates things like monsoons. And then in the winter months, air flows off the land. You get dry continental air where, like where we are, you get really cold, dry continental air in the winter. So here's an image just kind of showing you the, an idealized average surface air pressure for January. So we're in January. I'm recording this in January right now. And you can see that the at least some of the wind patterns here, like here we are up here. We're right here, and our, our general wind direction is out of the northwest, and that's true because a lot of our cold air comes down from northwest, you know, uh, northwest Canada, um, and then if it comes back around again, well, if we get those northeast winds, like associated with a low very often, um, that's where we get things like um, uh, lake effect snow. You know, every once in a while, a, a storm will pass such that the, the the winds on the back side of that storm will blow back east from the east to the west out over the from the lake back into Milwaukee and pound us with some lake effect snow. Now we don't get as much as places like Buffalo, New York do or Cleveland and some of the other areas on the Great Lakes or way up in Superior, but it does happen. But you can see some of the other wind patterns here in the, in, you got all of these equatorial 
you know, everything kind of flowing towards the equator in the north, in the northern hemisphere, it's going towards the southwest and in the southern hemisphere, it's going towards the northwest and they converge at the equator. Um, that doesn't really change even in January because they get sun all year long. It's, it's you know, it's very uh, warm all year long. So what I want you to get out of this particular image is just that sort of the general trend for the middle of winter that at least for where we are, our winds are generally out of the northwest, which typically means cold. If we if we happen to get a, a quote unquote warmer day in the winter, typically those winds are coming out of the southwest or southeast because it's warmer as you go south. So here's the other run, the opposite of that, which is in July, which is typically the other extreme for the year. January and July are sort of uh, the opposite of each other. And you could see right here where we are again, generally our winds are coming out of the southeast, southwest. Now in summer in Wisconsin or Milwaukee, if we have southeast winds, sometimes you'll get cooler by the lake because those winds are coming off over the lake and we'll usually get a lot of times we'll get a lot of moisture out of that. If they're out of the southwest or out of the west or northwest, it has a tendency to be a little drier depending on where the storms, if there's any storms coming in. But in general, the winds are out of the southeast, south um, here in Wisconsin in the summer months. Now we have these in where we live, in the mid latitudes, we're at 43 degrees north here in uh, Milwaukee. Um, we have what are called the westerly winds, and they're they're interrupted by cyclones or low pressure zones. They move from west to east in the northern hemisphere, and then we they create both anticyclonic and cyclonic flow. So, typically, you have a low associated with a high, or a high with a low behind it. You have sort of these rotating, they usually come in pairs. Now, sometimes one will be up in Canada and one will be down in the Midwest or, you know, depending on where things are, but uh, the, where they are dictated by the upper air flow. Again, we have those, uh, the jet stream up there, that river of air, and depending on where that is, it helps steer these um, lows and highs, these anti-cyclones and cyclones, to where they're gonna be. And in the winter time, um, a lot of times, again, those are coming down out of Canada. And when that, that jet stream sort of settles down over Wisconsin, that's where we usually get sub-zero days. And just the opposite, when it kind of gets pushed back up into Canada, especially in spring and summer, that's when we get the really warm days. But a, a lot of that is dictated by where the jet stream is. And we'll talk more about the jet stream and where it is when we get to things like El Nino and La Nina. Now, local winds, you know, right around here, like your house, um, those are what we call small scale winds. And they're usually land and sea breezes if you're near the ocean or mountain and valley regions, uh, breezes, excuse me. Or if you're in California, things like Chinook and Santa Ana winds, depending because of the nature of where they are in relation to the ocean and mountains. Um, but those are produced by temperature differences over small scales. And, you know, sometimes you can get really, really big temperature differences. Now, we've had storms here in Milwaukee where the temperature will drop 20, 30 degrees in a matter of minutes. Well, typically with those kind of storms, you have not only a temperature drop, but you usually have what's called a gust front or a huge amount of wind associated with it. The strongest thunderstorms are typically fast moving and have a high, very, very high pressure gradient or a very narrow one, excuse me, that um, brings in those high winds that can be 50, 60, even higher. Uh, usually around here, we top out around 60 miles an hour. Hopefully they're not more than that, um, unless if it's a tornado, but that's a whole nother uh, thing. So you can see there are these things called land and sea breezes. So during the daylight hours, the cooler, denser air over the water moves into land. This is exactly why we get cooler by the lake in the in the summertime here at Mil in Milwaukee. And sometimes it's annoying, you know, you get a nice, beautiful 80 degree day, you head down to the lake and it's like 50 degrees down there because the water's still cold. So you have this, 
the cool, denser air that flows back into the water, generating a, what we call a sea breeze. In our case, it would be a lake breeze, but it's the same principle. All right. And then at night, it all goes switches around the other day. So the land cools rapidly, more rapidly than the lake, in our case, the lake, and generates the wind switches around essentially 180 degrees and it goes back out uh, over the lake. This is very common and happens all the time if you spent enough time down right by Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan is a large enough body of water for this phenomenon to take place. Now they're talking about oceans and it's much more pronounced at the oceans, but in some areas, you know, if you have warm ocean water, the ocean breezes aren't cold. You know, I was in Key West not too long ago and it's not cold down there, even with the ocean breezes. Um, but around here, because Lake Michigan is so cold, those lake breezes really play a, a dramatic role. Um, on my commute to and from work, um, I take the Hone Bridge across, and it's always fun watching my temperature gauge. I've had it where it'll literally go almost a 30 degree difference from where I live in Oak Creek all the way to um, uh, where I work. You know, just <laughs> the, the temperature change will be like 20, 30 degrees once you get down by the lake. And then when you go back home, it goes back up. And it's just, it's crazy. Another phenomenon that occurs is what we call valley and mountain breezes. So during the day, the slopes of the mountains heat rap more rapidly than way down here at the bottom. So what happens is, is this air up here gets heated quicker and starts to kind of go up the va up these uh, sides of the slopes and it often creates these cumulus clouds at the top. And you could see that on both sides here. Now, obviously, this is a cartoon, but you get the idea. So it's going to be cooler, um, you know, it's going to be warmer up here, and you'll get this breeze that will kind of go upslope. Well, at night, what happens is the mountains, the land, cools faster than the, the air does, so or the, the surrounding area. So that air becomes more dense and starts to kind of push itself back down slope creating this sort of cool pocket down at the bottom. And if you've ever walked around or done any kind of night night hiking, you might have experienced this. I have experienced this where you kind of go down into a low spot and all of a sudden it's like a couple degrees colder. And it's like, woo, <laughs> it kind of catches you off guard. But it's, it's a really neat effect, though, that you have this sort of pocket of cold air. Now, in some of the research that I do, it has to do with vineyards, like, places that grow grapes for wines, and they absolutely do not want this. Gr vineyard grape vines hate cold. <laughs> and they, you, what you don't want to do is put your vines in areas what are called cold sinks, which is what this is, and it, which is an area where they just sit in this pocket of cold air, and they can literally just sort of freeze, and um, vines are very susceptible to temperature changes. So we use two main things to measure wind, di direction and speed. So the wind direction is labeled from where it originates from. So if you look at this wind sock, yes, it's, it's facing in this direction, right? So that means that's the way the wind is going. It's coming from the right side of the screen and going to the left, all right? And so that's how we designate the wind direction. So if, the, if this wind sock is facing the south, that means the wind is coming from the north. Now, what we usually use for this is what's called a wind vane. And that's what that is. It's a wind that we call that a wind sock, but it's the same thing. You know, you've seen the classic rooster with the various directions on it, and it'll point downwind because the wind will uh, change its direction. So that's called a wind vane. So we want to know which direction the wind is coming from. Again, like I've mentioned in several slides, because that often tells us what might happen down the road in terms of our weather. If the weather in the winter, if the weather, uh, the, the, the wind is out of the northwest, it probably is going to get pretty cold. In the summer, if the wind is out of the southeast or south, we're probably going to get rain or a lot of humidity, if nothing else. When we measure wind, we the direction is low, either like a compass point, like for out of the north, out of the east, or a scale from 0 to 360. So 0 is north, 180 degrees is south, 
90 degrees is east, 270 degrees would be west. You also have what's called prevailing wind direction. Now, if you here is two two images. This is sort of New York City or the northeast uh, of the country. The prevailing wind is out of the northwest. Okay, so it goes in this direction. Whereas here in Australia, by far, by far, the wind is out of the southeast, blowing in this direction. You can see how long that line is. That doesn't mean they don't get wind out of the other directions. That just means that the vast majority of the time, the wind is coming out of the southeast and blowing in that in the northwest direction. <laughs> now, wind speed is measured typically with a cup anemometer, and you might have seen these, you know, spinning somewhere. And that's what that does is that it generates a little you know voltage or whatever and then it tells the instrument hey the wind is moving at 10 miles an hour or 20 or whatever it is um, and then you can see also here here's this thing spins to measure the wind speed and then you can see here's the weather vane which tells you which direction the wind is coming from now when we measure wind we're cha measuring changes in wind direction associated with the locations of both highs and lows or cyclones and anticyclones now what wind direction and wind like i mentioned wind speeds do is they often tell you what's going to happen is the temperature going to go up or down you know or is it going either are we going to get much more moisture you know like i said in the summer months here in wisconsin if all of a sudden those winds come out of the southeast and south that typically means we're about to get some rain not always, but, or at least if nothing else, a lot of humidity being brought up from the south. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit in terms of we've been talking about wind and what pressure gradients and how we measure them and all of those things play a role, but there are a few things globally that we need to account for and one of them is el nino and one of them is el nino or la nina excuse me now el nino is uh, a counter current that flows southward along coasts of ecuador and peru it's warm water it usually occurs around christmas time and it blocks the upwelling of colder nutrient filled water and um anchovies starve from lack of food that's one of the ways we know that this is occurring and some of the strongest ones we've ever had is in 1982-83 and 97-98. And I actually remember the 97-98 one. I was in college then, so um, I remember that. So if you looking at the bottom there, that the 97-98 event caused heavy rains, super heavy rains, and very bad storms in California, because it all this this water, this counter current of of uh, water that's being dictated by the winds um it changes our entire weather patterns and i'll show you that in some slides here coming up now it's related to large scale atmospheric circulation so we have the southern oscillation which is between the eastern and western pacific and i'm going to show you images of this so if it doesn't make sense right here uh, don't worry about it it changes the trade winds and creates major change in the equatorial system it essentially alters the flow of everything that would normally be in place based upon these upper large-scale atmospheric circulation changes now the effects are highly variable depending on where you are and the size of the warm water pool so the la the larger the el nino has a tendency to have more warm water so the, 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 the bigger the circulation that's taking place or the bigger the change in the circulation, the more noticeable the effects of the El Nino are going to be. So here's an image of El Nino. So during an El Nino event, the pressure over the Eastern Pacific drops while the pressure over the Western Pacific rises. This causes the trade winds to diminish, leading to an eastern movement of warm water along the equator. This strengthens the equatorial countercurrent, causing surface waters of the Central and Eastern Pacific to warm with far-reaching consequences for weather patterns. So if you, I'm, I turn my camera off here so you guys could see this a little better. You have very, very, uh, this backwards 
current that's taking place. And what happens is the trade winds diminish, which are typically going in this direction, causing this warm water to be pushed towards South America. And that's what kills off a lot of the fish. And it also creates a situation where it um, helps. It's weird how it works, but it ends up pounding the Western United States at the same time. La Nina is the opposite of El Nino, it means little girl, uh, triggered by colder than average surface temperatures in the Eastern Pacific. So a typical La Nina winter here blows colder than normal air over the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Great Plains while warming the rest of the United States. Now that includes Wisconsin. Typically when there's La Nina taking place, we actually have warmer than normal temperatures. Um, what it does is it sort of presses the jet stream and keeps it up in Canada. That doesn't mean we can't get cold, but on average, we're just far enough south where it keeps the jet stream um, just far north, far enough north where we don't get that super bitter cold. But you also get this huge amount of precipitation in the, the west and northwest. Like I said, California gets, um, that's during El Nino, but in the northwest, it pushes all of that upwards and it forces uh, more precipitation in the Northwest. I'm gonna turn my camera off here for a second again. So this is an image of the La Nina. Now during a La Nina event, strong trade winds drive the equatorial currents towards the West. So they're going back towards the direction they should be and pushing all that warm water westward. All right, so that causes this upwelling of, of uh, ocean here on the east side of that off the coast of Peru and Ecuador, which the La Nina is a gift for them. So all of this upwelling of cold water brings with it nutrients, which brings with it really, really good fishing. Whereas unfortunately, the opposite of that is Australia and Malaysia and those areas, they get flooding. They get tons of way more wet uh, precipitation than they're used to. So it all depends on where you are geographically as to whether or not El Nino or La Nina benefits or doesn't benefit you. For us in Wisconsin, typically La Nina is better for us um, as far as I know. So events associated with both El Nino and La Nina are now understood to have significant influence almost everywhere. This has become sort of a global phenomenon. Um, and scientists watch these occur. They, they monitor ocean temperatures and things like that so they can forecast it out ahead of time because it plays a huge role in economies. Think about it. If all your fish off the shore during an El Nino event in Peru and um, uh, down there in South America, Ecuador, if all your fish are dying, you got problems. So they want to know ahead of time what's going on with El Nino or La Nina. This image here shows the various impacts of both El Nino in the winter, El Nino in the summer, La Nina in the winter, and La Nina in the summer. And you can see, I think I may have had it backwards, but I, I, um, I'm pretty sure I remember hearing that La Nina kept it warm here. But I'm, I could be wrong about that, I apologize. But according to this, it's warmer here in, during El Nino. But I, I'm almost positive during La Nina, maybe we get less snow. That could be what I was thinking. I remember in a La Nina winter where it was pretty mild and we got very little snow that particular year. So I guess it just depends. Maybe we're not in the cold zone. <laughs> now, globally, the distribution of precipitation is relatively complex. Um, it's related to global wind and pressure patterns. So for example, in high pressure regions, you have the subsiding area of divergent winds and you typically have dry conditions. For example, areas like the Sahara and Kalahari deserts, deserts which are typically associated with around 30 degrees latitude. You know, these are, it's bright and sunny all the time. Um, look at like San Diego or even Las Vegas. They don't get a whole lot of rain there. It, because of they're kind of stuck in these high pressure zones. Now, just on the opposite of that, you have low pressure regions where you have converging winds and lots and lots of precipitation like the Amazon and Congo basins, 
which makes sense. You're at the equatorial regions. You have lots of moisture, lots of uh, rising air that um, creates these uh, weather patterns that are conducive to precipitation. So here is an image showing you sort of the global precipitation uh, patterns for the entire Earth. And you can see, obviously, here in the Amazon, here in the Congo region, and then obviously Malaysia is where they get the bulk majority of the rain. Those are the equatorial regions. Now, if you look at the opposite side of that, here is the deserts of the Sahara at 30 degrees north. Here's these deserts here. Now, this is desert up here as well, the Gobi Desert, but that's a it's a desert for a different reason because of the Himalayan mountains caused a lot of that. Down here, you at 30 degrees south, you have the Australian desert. So those are areas typically located. Uh, here we have the deserts down here as well. Um, you have these areas stuck in these high pressure zones, which just don't get any precipitation. Or they're at elevation, for example, here in the Atacama region in South, uh, South America. Some of the driest places on Earth are in South America. Now, large land masses in the middle latitudes often have less precipitation towards their centers. That's where we are. We're kind of average in terms of the type of precipitation. We don't get nearly as much as, let's say, Florida, but we still get more than maybe some of the polar regions. Now, mountain barriers also play a huge role because you, if you're on one side of the mountains, you're in the arid side. If you're on the, uh, for example, if you're on the windward slopes, you re receive lots of rainfall. Or if you are on the, the leeward side, you get very little rainfall. This is no more, I mean, you, it doesn't get more pronounced than down in South America. Like I just mentioned in the previous slide, in, on the windward slopes in South America, they get lots of rain. But when you get on the leeward side of that in the Atacama Desert, the Atacama Desert gets less rain than almost anywhere on Earth. There are places in the Atacama Desert where it hasn't rained in over 100 years. Look it up. It's pretty crazy. So um, Hawaii has some of this as well. Hawaii, uh, places in Hawaii have very drastic amounts of rainfall. Um, there's places uh, where, you know, you in a short period of time, like I said, in, you'll get areas that get so much rainfall. And as soon as that air tries to get over this set of mountains, it all dries out and fizzles out. So that's it for chapter this chapter, and I hope that you learned a little bit more about air pressure and wind. Um, it's it's a fascinating subject because it plays a role in everything we do. I, I mean, climate is something you have to deal with every day, wherever you live. And some people have to deal with it less. If you live in San Diego, you have pretty much the perfect weather all year long. Whereas if you live in places like Wisconsin, we get very different weather depending on the season. Um, but that's why we like living here. I like having four seasons. Not everybody does. They want to move to Florida or California or, you know, uh, those types of places so that they have warm more often than cold or never have cold. But then you have other things associated with it. So it's all personal preference. But I hope you learned a little bit of something and I'll see you in the next chapter. Take care.